Welcome back to Two Trees in a Pod with Alyssa and Sam, where we talk about all things life and relationships and tie it back to faith. I'm Alyssa. And I'm Sam. And today we are excited to talk to you about the resurrection and why we believe it to be fact. Let's get into it. So, happy post-Easter. We're recording this before Easter, but it will drop, so you say right after Easter, so we figured it was the closer Tuesday to Easter, so that's why we're talking about it after. And right after having a nice long Easter holiday with what we assume everyone to be with their families, or if not, it's the perfect time to look back, reflect, and see, you know, our thoughts. The true meaning of Easter, per se. Exactly, and how it's not, believe it or not, it's not about a giant bunny that lays candy around your house. Well, is it about eggs? I don't think it's about eggs. Alyssa, <laughs> what's it all about? Well, Easter is about our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. It's the literal entire point of Christianity. It's bigger than Christmas because without Easter, Christmas doesn't mean anything. So we're going to kind of dive into that and we're going to dive into why we believe the, re- the resurrection of Christ to be like a stone cold historical fact, which is the whole point of our faith. So, Sam, what what is Easter? You're a new believer. How would you explain that to someone who doesn't really... I mean, we all know in secular America that it has something to do with Jesus, but why don't you give us a, a little picture? Well, the easiest and most simplest way to explain it is Easter is the day that Jesus was resurrected. So on Good Friday, it was the day that he was crucified. Sunday is the day that he was brought back from the dead and raised back to life. So we celebrate Easter because we celebrate Christ's resurrection and how when we die in our flesh that God resurrects us because our souls are for eternity because we believe in him. Exactly. It's very nicely nicely put. So you'll often hear Christians say like, he is not here. He is risen. The tomb is empty. Easter is when, was it Mary Magdalene? She goes to the tomb. I think she's with someone else as well. And I think it was two Marys, right? I think it might've been both the Marys, Jesus's mom, but they go to the tomb and he is not there. He's not there. There's no one there. The stone has been rolled away and there is no body. And then Jesus appears to them, and they didn't recognize him at first, but they eventually do. And then Jesus appears to over 500 witnesses over the course of him being resurrected. So why is the resurrection so important to our faith? Like, we always look at Christmas as the big Christian holiday. Why is it that I say Christmas is pointless without Easter. So Christmas being Jesus's birth is very important. You can even argue that resurrection could never happen if he wasn't born in the first place, but he was, is, and forever will be. So when you think that Jesus was there before he was even born, that just means that his birth of Christmas was going to be a given. The difference between Christianity and all of these other religions Jesus was resurrected. That is a question that most humans, dare I say all humans, struggle with and contemplate with, is what happens after death or passing on this earth. Christianity is the only religion and faith where there's an answer. And it's through Jesus that we are saved. It's also the only religion where... The religious leader, quote, Messiah, unquote, was resurrected from the dead. And um, Islam, doesn't Muhammad just kind of fly up to heaven on, like, chariots? Yeah. Something like that. I don't think he's resurrected from the dead. I think on that same topic, there are 500 plus believers all in different areas, different locations, that all saw the same thing, which was Jesus coming back to them. Well, he appeared to the 500, the crowd of 500 at the same time, but he appeared to the apostles at different times. I think it was first Peter, then 
the 11, and then he approved to Paul last. Yeah, and you think about that, it's okay. Maybe you can get a few people together. They can all plot and say, oh, you know, let's let's fake this whole Christianity thing. How do you get 500 people with the same exact story and then additional people with the same exact story when they were in different locations, different times, different people, and they all said the same exact thing? In our student-athlete Bible study this week, we did a fun exercise called... I guess it doesn't really have a name, but, like, it was fake the resurrection. Like, imagine you were going to fake the resurrection. How would you do it? And shocker, nobody could come up with an answer. I think the most interesting one we heard was (laughs) we're going to drug a crowd of 500 people and (laughs) make them, like, have someone who looks similar to Jesus appear (laughs) And (laughs) they're all going to be so out of their minds that they'll believe that it's Jesus. But that wouldn't even work because (laughs) he appeared to people who... Weren't there. Wait, what? Who weren't there, like, part of the 500. He appeared to other people. Oh, yeah. He appeared to people who knew him very personally up close. Like, so they wouldn't fall for, like, a doppelganger type situation. It It was funny to hear a bunch of people bounce theories around. And... What I thought was really interesting with that whole exercise is there were a list of facts that scholarly authors and researchers all agree on, whether they were atheist, Christian, Muslim, Jewish. They were, there was like this list of all facts, legitimate facts of the time that were all agreed upon by all these scholars of different faiths. And <laughs> our job was to fake the resurrection, fake Christianity, while using all of these facts agreed on by all of these scholars. And you really couldn't, because all of them put together, there was no way of denying it or trying to fake it. Well, it's also true that, like, some, you hear some atheists say, like, well, Jesus wasn't a real person. That's, it's a historical fact that he was a human being who walked this earth and all scholars from all religious backgrounds, all beliefs, they agree that Jesus was a real human person. And they also agree that he had disciples who believed that he could perform miracles and he had disciples who were willing to die because of that belief. And these are all things that every, all these scholars from all these different backgrounds and beliefs, they all agreed on this. So it makes you think, how are these scholars keeping their own beliefs? But that, that's that's a whole different story. <laughs> that's another combo, yeah. But it is interesting to me that like people who don't believe that Jesus is the Messiah or don't believe that there is a God at all can agree on all those facts about who Jesus was. I think one of them was like, he was politically inconvenient yeah yeah not was it subservient yeah he he'd subvert the existing he he was basically like a political dissident yeah fighting against and which is why he was killed he was going against the roman empire he was well he wasn't going against the roman empire the roman empire saw him as a threat yeah i guess and honestly wasn't it pontius pilate who like basically was like i wash my hands of this man's blood it's on your hands because like I find him to be innocent. Yeah. So it was really the the Jews at the time who executed him who disbelieved that he was the Messiah. Which is almost ironic because they put the crown of King of Jews over him. The so. they put a label Jesus King of the Jews and they put a crown of thorns on him. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, we were kind of talking about at our Bible study because, like, that whole theme was, like, why the resurrection actually happened and, like, why it's a historical event and it's not just, like, fiction, I guess. That always, as someone who was secular with no faith life prior to this last year or so, how did it get to the point where all of Easter is just about a bunny? about candy about why was the true meaning of why the holiday itself was put together to 
to celebrate the resurrection. How did it get twisted over the years to be a giant Easter bunny that's just giving away candy and chocolate? How did Christmas get to twisted be to a be... guy with a bag of toys who likes cookies? I don't have the answer to that. I don't know how these... Super... Capitalism. Okay, well, that's fair. How did these extremely important and crucial holidays signifying the Christian faith turn into basically these giant media stunts to sell people a bunch of stuff and honestly make it the most disrespectful representation of these days possible? Oh, Jesus was born. Let's put this big, fat, jolly dude wandering around stealing your milk and cookies. So are you saying you don't believe in Santa? <laughs> uh, for all of our <laughs> younger viewers. No. But, or like, oh, the resurrection day. Oh, let's place a big, stupid Easter bunny there. Like, So you're anti-Easter. It, it almost feels disrespectful coming to this point. Also, I wasn't raised as a Christian. Why are all these people who aren't Christians celebrating Christmas and Easter? That doesn't make sense to me, and I lived through it. Well, and let me ask a question. Why thought, did you celebrate them when you weren't a believer? Because everyone did. That's the answer. It's but, because we live in a society. We live in a society <laughs> where um, a lot of people are Christian. And then, this is my theory, like people feel left out when they don't, believe but they still want to celebrate like the big holiday because like imagine we're an atheist family and our kids are like why doesn't the easter bunny come visit us why doesn't santa come visit us you know which isn't the meaning of either of those holidays but i always thought it's because people would feel left out yeah that's probably why it's just kind of sad because it's like oh and that's, I mean, we that can be a whole sidetrack thing with Christmas, but, like, having your kid believe in Santa and then shattering that reality and how that can sever that potential... It sounds like you have some childhood trauma you want to walk, walk, work through here no, with I don't not believing t- in Santa anymore. <laughs> no, that ended for me. Over it sounded like, like it shattered for you. No, that was like a random summer day, and we were like, buying a video game and my dad just goes so you know santa's not real right i'm like oh okay well i do now i, ca- I kind of thought that it was like in july too it was just out of nowhere but that didn't really phase me i kind of knew it sounds like it did phase you it really does <laughs> thanks therapist yeah well i don't know you're talking about how it shattered your reality no i'm saying did the easter bunny being your parents shatter your reality too no not really <laughs> but think about it if you're brought up with quote unquote faith in santa and then that's ripped away you can compare it to the same kind of faith that you would have in god that same kind of connection of believing in what you can't see which is quite literally what faith is and then say okay well that was a lie oh god's probably a lie christmas is just made up to give presents easter's just something made up to give candy and then it just completely destroys the entire purpose and meaning of, well, this is why you should have faith. These things are very important. And now it's just some secular holiday where you just buy a bunch of things and completely lose the meaning of why it was there in the first place. I hear what you're saying, but I'm going to play devil's advocate here really quick. Trigger warning. Um, Faith, yes, is built on things that we cannot see, but we also have, like, we don't have a Bible explaining why Santa is real. We have a Bible explaining why God is real and all the literal historical events that have happened. Like we have historical confirmation that Jesus existed. And when you read the Bible, have you seen that photo of all the lines of where the Bible prophesies things that come true? Like to me, I'm like, it's not even believing in what you can't see when you talk about Christianity and faith, you're believing in history. You're believing in what God has done. And to me, I guess that's how it can be different. That's fair. No, I mean, there is a much bigger difference between Christianity and Santa. Uh, I'm (laughs) definitely not going to try and argue that point. That's a bad battle to fight. You've already lost, yeah. (laughs) I guess my feeling is just, why are they aligned, not even closely, but directly with? these giant historical events 
that were so important. I feel like it's to take the meaning away in some way. You think so? It feels that way. Mm. It's these giant... And I also wasn't raised Christian, so I don't know what the growing up Christian Christmas or Easter looked like. That was just wasn't where I'm going. Why don't you ask me? Because I was raised Christian and Hmm. I did Santa and the Easter Bunny and all that. Okay, Alyssa, what are your thoughts on Christmas and Easter being raised Christian? To me, when I found out that Santa was my parents assembling dollhouses at (laughs) 3am, it didn't really rattle my world. To me, when I found out, I didn't really find out. I just kind of was like, you know what? That whole like reindeer thing flying in the sky doesn't really make sense. Oh, and so you're just smart. I was just smarter than everyone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm kidding. And the Easter you Bunny intellect on two trees. Of yeah, God. I I was just an intellectual. <laughs> was <laughs> was yes. Um, really. <laughs> but Sam just cracked his neck right into the microphone. Um, Now I've lost my train of thought. I hate when you do that. Anyways. Um, So you're an intellect and you knew Christmas wasn't real just because you were able to decode it. Yes, I was able to decode it. I don't even know what age I figured it out. But um, the Easter Bunny to me, like, I don't know if I ever was buying that. Like, I don't remember ever (laughs) buying that. Like, I remember we had a neighbor who would dress up as the Easter Bunny, and he would, like, he was such a sweet guy. I'm pretty sure he's since passed away, so God rest his soul. But he would dress up as Santa and as the Easter Bunny, and he would come visit all, like, the neighborhood houses. And I remember, like, looking out the window and seeing him walk down the street in, like, a full bunny costume. (laughs) So to me, that was the Easter Bunny. And then, like, we would come down and see, like, baskets and stuff, and I'd be like, sweet candy but like i never really i don't want to say that i never really fell for the easter bunny but to me it was always like my neighbor Mm -hmm. (laughs) so like i never really had my world shattered i guess when i figured out santa wasn't a thing i was just like okay and like i still have presents under the tree (laughs) you know like it to me it wasn't Santa that mattered to me. It was, like, the toys I was getting. Which is another bad thing but think about, about Christmas. Th- okay, there. Now now my side of the argument's winning. So you just turned something that's a super important day, celebrating Jesus' birth, into all I care about is the presents. Well, that's what I cared about in terms of Santa. I always knew that it was celebrating Jesus' birth. I wouldn't say always knew. Like, I wasn't a six-month-old baby being like, Happy birthday, Jesus! On Christmas, you know? I don't think I was really conscious at that point. But, um... Oh, I thought you were just smarter and you already knew. You know, I was an intellect, but... Um... Growing up Christian, it was just always a part of the conversation. So it was Santa and Easter Bunny and all that stuff. It kind of wrapped up with, like, the fairy tale category. Like, when you think about, like... I don't know, you weren't really big into fantasy, but, like... I would build like fairy houses in my backyard and that would always be super fun. I don't think I really ever believed in fairies, you know, or like mermaids. Like I love learning about mermaids and dragons and all that stuff. I never really thought they were real, but like the fantasy aspect of it was cool to me. And so when it comes to like the Easter Bunny and stuff compared to like faith in Jesus and faith in God, to me that was always taught as factual. It wasn't in the same fantasy context. So I guess there was like a good balance because like when we would pray, it wasn't like we're fake praying at dinner. It was like, we're praying to God or like we would say happy birthday, Jesus on Christmas. So like, I remember asking my mom if we could bake Jesus a birthday cake, like that kind of stuff. So like that kind of thing felt separate. So it honestly felt like celebrating two different holidays. sounds like a great, balance (laughs) it felt like two different holidays like there was the santa secular christmas that we celebrated and then there was like the jesus christmas so it was like two different things like i for some reason in my brain i had them separated easter i don't know how much i understood the resurrection until i was older like i don't think that was a concept i could come to grips with until i was like a high schooler and i think that's fair i feel like that's probably a difficult topic for Because you don't even understand death when you're that young. So how do you understand the significance of somebody coming back from the dead? Yeah, that's... 
<laughs> I, I don't. Adults struggle to explain this and interpret exactly. it. Exactly. Well yeah. So like, I didn't really. I mean, I would always be like, "Yeah, this is when Jesus came back and saved us." Did I have any idea what I was talking about at like seven years old? No. But like, I remember a lot of our story times at night where we had like a kid's Bible, so we would read that. So I was aware of it all. But how much was I really comprehending? That's like pretty much all of it because you were all a genius of it child. Because I was an intellectual. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying, put me in a room of fourth graders right now, I'll destroy them. <laughs> gifted child, I was always gifted. I'm still gifted. I'll destroy all these fourth graders right now. <laughs> but anyways, I think something that's cool about I guess not cool about the crucifixion, but like really interesting is that it was predicted before 500, what was it, more than 500 years before crucifixion was invented? Mm-hmm. In Psalm 22, David predicts the crucifixion, talking about, let's see, let me get the right, the right verse here. They pierce my hands and my feet. All my bones are on display. People stare and gloat over me. They divide my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. And piercing your hands and your feet. What does that sound like? That sounds like crucifixion. It sounds like crucifixion. When this was written, crucifixion hadn't been invented yet. And then also in that same part, they cast lots for different articles of clothing. Yeah, just like the Roman soldiers casting lots for Jesus' clothes during the crucifixion. It's almost like it was impossible to fake because it was something that was always there, discussed and recorded. Also... Another thing, um, I don't know if I'm going to be able to find the verse, because I just have like a Bible right here, that um, in John, he talks about the crucifixion. He talks about when Jesus was on the cross. So in crucifixion, the Roman soldier in charge of the crucifixion, the punishment for the prisoner being crucified not dying was the Roman soldier himself being crucified. So there was a great amount of incentive to get it right, you know, because if you don't get it right, this is going to happen to you. It's a life or death situation for a Roman guard. And in the Bible, in the Gospel of John, it's written, so what do they do to make sure that the prisoner dies from crucifixion? They, they, uh, they stab him with a spear, correct? They spear you in the heart, yeah. And so they, the Roman soldier speared Jesus in the heart. People witnessed it, and they said blood and water poured out of him when that happened. And like we were talking about at AIV, at our Bible study, a cardio surgeon, a cardiac surgeon would say that as a heart attack because your water water swells in your heart when that happens. And other than that, there wouldn't be water coming out of your heart. And that's not medical knowledge that they had when it was written. So it's like confirmed that he died during the crucifixion. Because one of those theories is that he was like, that like the crucifixion was faked, is or the resurrection was faked, is that he was just like kind of dead. Like he looked kind of dead and then he came back. Right. But he was like dead dead. So it was confirmed that Jesus was a real person. It was confirmed that he was killed on the cross. Mm-hmm. How do you confirm that he was resurrected? How do you fake it? Exactly. You can't fake it. You have all of these people testifying that it happened. You have the disciples quite literally defending it until they die. They died for it, actually. Like all of the disciples except Peter? No, Peter Peter was Peter died. Um not Simon Peter was the same person. Um but John, right? He was the one who died of old age. All of the disciples but one Died they were martyred. Jesus. They, were, they martyred. were all martyrs. Yes, and they were like executed type stuff for their faith and for not. They they were refusing to deny the resurrection, and that's what ultimately got them killed because they couldn't deny it because they saw it with their own eyes and they saw Jesus resurrected, and like we talked about this in AIV too, like the significance of death back in the day, like. It's not like they didn't see Jesus die, because I'm sure you could be like, 
oh, well, you must not have been really dead if here you are walking and talking alongside me. They saw him die. They, they, they watched the life go out of him. And then they just see him walking and talking with them three days later. Like, like it was nothing, you know? <laughs> so it must take a great amount of faith to believe that. We watched that funny video that was like, if the disciples, if the apostles faked the resurrection, it was like <laughs> them all huddled up. They were like, guys, we have an idea. We're going to steal the body. We're going to have a lookalike, fake the resurrection, right? Like appear to a bunch of people, say it's Jesus. And then we're all going to get killed. <laughs> <laughs> we're all going to get persecuted. But do we get rich? No. Why would that happen? We just die. We all get brutally executed. Woo! <laughs> yeah, woo! <laughs> so, like, there was literally no motivation for them to fake it either because they had no idea that, it, like, they were going to be looked at as, like, saints today, as, like, heroes of the faith. Like, they had no idea. All they knew is in their life on Earth, they were going to get persecuted and eventually all but one killed for that. All of that. And what did they gain out of it from a outside point of view? Hatred. Uh, they gained yeah. a lot of hatred. They gained a lot of pain. They gained a lot of suffering. They, they gained, gained execution. A, they gained execution. Are you going to fake something so you can just endure all of that? I feel like there's got to be something more. Also, when my, my small group at AIV got caught up in figuring out how to even get to the body, because Jesus' body was put inside a tomb with a massive stone in front of it, and the stone was sealed, and then there was a guard posted outside of the tomb. To even get to his body, like, to even get the stone rolled away, like, what a process that would be. Like, it's absolutely insane to me that, like... Ugh, I just can't imagine it any other way, you know? And How did I, you come? Let's let's wrap this up with, since you are a new believer who probably, it's not like you were hyper-atheist or anything, so you weren't, like, denying it all, but you just hadn't really thought about it, right? How did you come to believe the resurrection to be truth? Uh, I mean, the first step was reading the Bible. That helped. <laughs> but... <laughs> it was funny. So I went through, I was never debating Christianity on a fact or logic kind of standpoint. I was just never interested and it was never a part of my day. And after finally reading the Bible, talking with God and having that, and after I not only came to terms, but I was saved and I talked with God, everything else just made logical sense. I never, after I was saved, there was nothing in the Bible for me to question because I wouldn't have been saved if any of that was wrong. So when it comes to the story of the resurrection or any other story in the Bible for that matter, I know that I can assume and know for a fact that all of it is true based on my life and my experiences. And that's where it's difficult to share and explain to people. I can't explain that I was saved and I can say this without fault, that I know it is all true. But I can. That's what I am saying. I say I know without a doubt that this is all true. This is my reasoning why. And that's where I'm like, you're going to have to take me at my word. You know that the first 25 years of my life... 24 years of my life, I didn't have a faith life. I wasn't interested, and it just wasn't part of my day. And now I can sit here without any any hesitation that it's true. It's all true. Every last part is true. So I don't have any, any room to <laughs> kind of debate on the fact. It's like, I just know this is true. This other stuff wouldn't have happened... And I wouldn't have experienced life the way I have if any of it was false. Yeah, that's kind of how I feel too, because it's not like I ever doubted the resurrection either. Because to me, it was just always something that was factual. And then looking back, like the more I look into the Bible, the more I realize how factual it is. Like, it just becomes more and more solidified. Like, nothing has made me doubt. I guess. Like, I've never come across anything that's made me doubt. I've come across people 
with all kinds of arguments. And I'm like, yeah, but even atheist scholars disagree with what you're saying. So to me, it's so impossible to doubt that the resurrection happened, that like there's no way it didn't happen. You know what I mean? Yep. Uh, exactly. So, in summary, the resurrection is a historical fact, cannot be argued with, and we believe it to be true, and we hope that you had a wonderful Easter, wonderful Resurrection Day, reflecting on Jesus and everything that he's done to get you to where you are now, and the love that he had for you on the cross, to die like that, to save us from our sins. So... We really appreciate you joining us on this episode, just kind of chatting resurrection, chatting bunnies and eggs, and even a little bit Santa and elves. <laughs> I, th- I think that should be the title of the episode, Bunnies and Eggs. Bunnies and Eggs. I like it. And yeah, so next week, next Tuesday on Two Trees in a Pod, we will be talking about some spring cleaning and we hope you join us. If not, that's okay. We'll just be a little offended. And (laughs) yeah, thank you for tuning in. Have a great week and stay blessed.